And so now I'm just going to talk about journey. Uh, this is why you're here. Um, <laughs> so in early 2006, this is before that game company was created, um, I already have this idea of for journey. Um, at the time, it was um, about the third year I've been playing Warcraft, uh, World of Warcraft. You know, I started uh, since early alpha because my friends works in Blizzard. I feel super privileged to be able to play this game before everybody. Um, but it was also the time I started getting really sick of World of Warcraft. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm really busy working at school and I almost have no social life. So um, being online, being with other people, the, the real people, they are on the internet, is something that makes me feel close and makes me feel less lonely. So when I'm playing game online, I wanted to have an emotional exchange with the other player. So, you know, kind of wanted to uh, have romance or friendship. But most of the time, um, the player doesn't care about those things. They like to talk, to talk about the strategy, how, how you're supposed to kill this boss, move over to the left, you know, and you're slow. And all they will say, you know, <laughs> now uh, I, I wanted this loot, and this is my turn, you, you're not supposed to get it. Um, and so I was kind of disappointed because the more I play this game, the more people I encounter, the more I realize I have no connection with any of these people. They just remind me that I'm a lonely person. Um, and so it's kind of sad. So I, I, I was hoping that there would be a different type of game out there um, that will satisfy my desire, I guess, to, to have a connection with people. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you can tell, I'm an introvert. I don't like to go to parties or bars. Um, so I was imagining this online world where there's no longer um, the difference between, you know, first of all, there's no... And, uh, no enemies you can kill, and there's no like armor sets, you know, like, oh, I, I'm platinum and you're only bronze, right? I want everybody to forget about those material things and just focus on the fact that we are all human. And so, I, um, the other thing I, I got, you know, quite annoyed is a lot of people will check to see if you're a guy or a girl in these online games, and it's always a, a sad ending. Uh, so, <laughs> and so I really want to see a game where there's no difference of gender and, and, and age. And yeah, sometimes I, I realize this guy I really have a connection to uh, during playing certain raids is actually a 12 years boy, and I, I just suddenly feel like such a disappointment. Uh, so I, I want to see a world where everybody is the same. You can't tell how old they are, what their gender is. They are all on their path. Uh, searching for something, I, you know, something, I don't know what that is. Um, and so I have this scene here where one person is just simply standing on a bridge, looking down in the, in the waterfall, and I'm just in, imagining a scenario where I can just walk up to him without a words, and he's just staring at the waterfall, and I decided to stop and, and look into the waterfall and, and thinking, why, why is he looking at there? And, and the, the very action of stopping and being next to someone and not keep moving on uh, gave me a feeling that that moment we are, we're together, we're, we're together for this. Um, and, but back then I was thinking about MMO because all I play is World of Warcraft. Um, so there's supposed to be lots of players. And this scene is something I really liked, I want to see in a game one day. Um, it's basically, uh, I also just finished Shadow of the Colossus, you know, how, how ridiculous that is. So, so, so in the scene, uh, there are these dark pillars, they're actually the legs of the giants, and they are, they are walking through the snowfield, kicking up all the dust. So it's very uh, foggy and dusty, and you can't see it in the front. And uh, you guys have to keep silent, because if you make noise, the giants will notice you. So you have to slowly kind of trudge through this plane and, and rely on the guy in front of you to lead you away from danger and at the same time being relied upon by the person behind you. Uh, and that feeling is something I, I really, really want to experience uh, in this game. Uh, but we had no money and there's no that game company back then. Um, so we were very, very lucky to be able to uh, find, a, find a deal uh, to work with Sony so, you know, they helped us to uh, build the previous two games. Uh, 
flow took us a year, flower two years. And so when we finish flower, we say, OK, finally, let's make our third game. And I feel like we're finally ready to tackle an online gameplay. Um, so we want to take what we learned from Flow and Flower and try to induce a new emotion uh, between two strangers online. So I looked up um, on the, the famous American mythologist Joseph Campbell, uh, who basically studied all kinds of myths around the world and figured out there's actually kind of an overarching story structure, a narrative structure that's shared in all these uh, mythical stories that's been passed along for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and it's widely embraced by Hollywood. Um, essentially, the hero's journey or the monomyth is a structure about transformation, a transformation in our lives. It could be big things and small things, right? Uh, the most famous is Star Wars, you know, a transformation of a young boy in a random planet turning into someone who saved the universe. Uh, or the Matrix, same deal. Uh, even the Lion King, right? Uh, <coughs> they all share the same story structure. Um, and so we were thinking, well, is it possible to use this structure to help us to evoke the feeling of awe? Um, and I put it down on, on a table. Uh, at the top row, <coughs> it's the three-act structure of Hollywood. And the middle one is the monomyth. And the bottom one, which I think is very interesting, uh, is the actual stages of life a human goes through. Because I believe if there's any big transformation, the biggest one is the transformation from life to death. Um, and then I applied emotional intensity numbers, kind of creating the arc. Um, and you can see, basically, everything just matches perfectly. I'm like, I didn't realize how perfect three act and monomyth and life is. And I have to make this game. Um, <coughs> so here's the emotional arc of Journey. Uh, this is the very first draft. Uh, but you can see, based on the arc, we start to create a map, uh, an entire world. Actually, the altitude of the world is kind of matching the arc. Uh, and then we put on you know, the life from the birth to a kid to a young man to, to you know, middle age and eventually struggle to die and transcend as a story back arc. And then we fill in the middle. We create the color and create the word, figure out what needs to be there to, to, be, to evoke all the necessary uh, emotions on the hero's journey. Um, then we got basically this very detailed emotional goal. You know, this is each level, each small area. We have all these rise and falls of the, the entire flow of the emotion. Um, and that is basically my design doc. My design doc is just one chart. Um, <coughs> we don't have anything bigger than two pages. We started prototyping uh, with co-op, because we know we wanted people to work with each other. So we started this prototype called Rope. Uh, so basically, it's a one-button game. You just press space. Um, and Rope is the action. You know, In the chat bubble, it's the action. And you can see a long-legged guy can't break rock because he doesn't have arm. But the fat guy, he has strength, so he can break a rock. But still, the chance is not always 100%, right? And so as they collaborate, here's a rope so they can climb up. Um, so the long leg guy runs fast, and he can jump through gaps. Um, and so, well, he didn't do it that time. But you know, with a rope, because anybody can, can lower a rope at any time, um, eventually, with the, the, the chance, you know, uh, they can collaborate. And we thought this is a great game, you know, you help each other. But then, you know, the problem is like, what if you're playing alone? You can't play this game. And, you know, Sony keep telling us like this game could have a great multiplayer, but it needs to have a single player. Otherwise, you will not sell your game, right? And so we're like, okay, well, this doesn't work. Uh, and here's an example where um, two people are collaborating and they're pushing a heavy rock. I mean, this is a very common co-op features I think most co-op games have, right? But if you're alone, you can't even finish this level. Um, even though there's a great feeling of collaboration, it becomes a quite a trouble for us when we wanted to design a game where it's possible to play alone. Um, and the other thing, you know, as you can see, most of the prototype early on is like Java and Flash. They're 2D prototypes. And stuff we thought was brilliant 
didn't work in 3D at all. So um, we started this idea about trail. So you know, if you walk in the desert, you can only see so far and from the top down. How would you know there's other player? And even if the other player exists, if they are moving towards one direction, how are you ever going to catch up if you all have the same speed? So if you walk on other people's trail, you will speed up. Um, and so eventually, you know, as you explore, you will run into other player, and you can see the the shout has been, uh, you know, uh, in very early prototype. I think that was a success. But in here, I'm trying to show you that if the player can uh, be next to each other, they become more stressful and they can climb up rocks. Um, and you know, but these mechanics. Uh, eventually, when you transfer into 3D, it's almost impossible to, to actually pull it off because cameras uh, and other things. Uh, so here's another uh, prototype we thought was smart, is when the two people are traveling, they, they get to go faster because they can leapfrogging from each other and, and, and you know, they can increase the speed. Um, another great idea we had, we thought was smart, is the idea of kind of... Uh, calling to distracting the monster. Uh, in Journey, you see the monster, right? So, but if you shout at them, uh, then the monster will not attack you. So between the two players, you might be able to collaborate and distract the monster and to get through. Um, but when we actually try to execute this idea in 3D, it's almost impossible to tell the distance between you and the monster and, and coordinate. It's, it's this is just way too hard. Um, and I, it tells me that I, you know, a top-down view is, is great for strategic maneuver and collaboration, but it's almost impossible in 3D. Um, so here's another scenario which we really uh, saw was a great idea, which also got killed. Um, you know, we thought about desert. Of course, there's sandstorm. So sandstorm is coming, and the people need to find a shelter. Uh, the shelter is kind of a gray color. Um, and you can see the sandstorm keep going. And if, if they stay in the shelter too intimately, the color of them will change to pink. Uh, I don't know what that means. Maybe they're shy. Uh, <laughs> and so um, this, this very scene of the sandstorm wiping the entire world um, it was a very powerful emotional experience. But in the end, when we bring to 3D, we realized how, t how difficult it is to actually do a sandstorm. And we just couldn't do it. So this is the character, um, as you know him. Um, or her, or it, and um, you might be surprised to know that one of the earliest drawings I did of this character actually looked like this. Um, very different. Um, this drawing, at the very beginning of the project, Genova and I talked about this idea of uh, characters that could communicate without language. And so one of our first ideas was to have them communicate with their eyes only. So I drew this character with big eyes. and. That didn't work out. So. Um, so we moved on, and we had this idea of cloth um, in the world. So I drew these a lot of drawings um, of these characters who had cloth all over them. And um, I really wanted the character to be dynamic and jump around. So I drew them jumping around and generally waving their cloth around. Um, so this is kind of. In the very early stages, I did this color piece to kind of get a mood um, feeling of the game. And this is a, one of the cloth-clad characters. And it's, in the foreground, you see this kind of giant snake idea. So the snake, the floating snakes that you see in the game um, were kind of an idea from the very beginning. Um, but the style kept changing. And one day, I drew this drawing, um, which I think really set the tone of the game. This was done in the first couple weeks of development and really kind of helped the team get a sense for the mood of the game we wanted to make. And the character on the left, um, the mask that he's wearing is kind of very similar to the final mask that we ended up going with. So we took this character. This is one of the first characters that we um, built in 3D and animated for the game. And you could actually run around in the game as this guy. And he had like 25 animations or something, so he could fly around and jump around and do all sorts of silly stuff. We also did a 2D prototype. Um, so I did these guys, and they're super fun. Um, yeah, it used to be that you could change your color in the beginning of the game, because we thought that people needed to be able to tell each other apart via color. So, But that idea changed. So um, when we first uh, pitched this idea of this game to Sony, we made it 
animated trailer and it had this character and I'm going to play that for you. So this is a very early version of how the game might have turned out. Let's see if this works. You might notice that that music that was in that trailer is actually the exact same music that is in the first trailer that we actually um, announced the game with. Austin Wintory, the composer, um, he came up with the theme like on the first day. It was kind of crazy. Um, the guy's amazing. The music of Journey is written by Austin Wintory, and he is my hero. You know, he's he's a god. I love him. He's just super talented. So then Genova reached out to me right after Flower came out and said, you know, I'd love to go to dinner and talk about our third game and see what you think. He was telling me all about his notions of the monomyth and Joseph Campbell and, and what all uh, he was hoping to achieve with this game. He said, so what we would love to move forward is if you could write a central musical theme from which the rest of it will kind of be derived. When we were still in the very start of the project, uh, he sent us a test piece of music, and it was just so beautiful. Genova came in with Kelly and pitched the game to us. The team over at TGC had created a PowerPoint presentation. Halfway through, they start a trailer, and this trailer is really more of a teaser of moods and feelings and, and these landscapes. And there was a musical piece that I think everyone now has heard, created by Austin Winery, the composer of the game. We did a, a little mock-up trailer to greenlight the game with his music in it, and it just it gave it the mood, and you know, I think that really was something that helped get the game off the ground. It's one of the only times that ever happened to me that we had the meeting, and then I walked to my car, and in that space of 50 yards, it was, it was there in my, in my head. I mean, exactly. It was one of those rare instances where it's just like a lightning strike, where I got to my car, and so I left myself this voicemail. It was like, okay, solo cello, you know, okay, and then maybe a harp should come in with bass flute, and it was like, it was crystal clear. So, you know, it was down in Santa Monica, so I got a, 30 mile drive or whatever back to the studio. So in that time, I called my cellist, Tina Guo, and I said, um, can you meet me at the studio in maybe 90 minutes? And uh, called my bass flute player, Amy Tatum, and said, can you meet me at the studio in 90 minutes? Did a quick mock-up of the orchestra aspect of it. And um, they came in and we read it and I, I sent it back and that game company, you know, in their typical way was kind of like, okay, this, yeah, this will work, let's, let's get going. 
this was actually the very first drawing I did of what eventually became the kind of bad guys in, in Journey. Um, this was one of the very first drawings I did for Journey at all. It was the very first drawing that had uh, the concept of the uh, slit of light that you walk into at the end of the game. You can see on the um, far side that there's like this white vertical line. It's kind of confusing, but that's what it is. Um, and the idea is that these floating scary things are kind of hunting you and there's like this idea of stealth gameplay. Um, so yeah, the first ideas I had for these were these kind of organic sandworms. Um, that's kind of cliche. Um, for a long time we had this guy in the game. He was just kind of flying around in the sky and I put these little funny eyeballs on him and um, early 3D prototype I did uh, for one of the early levels we had. We were going to have a level called the canyon where players would run around in the steep canyon, but it eventually turned into this area in the game. Um, quite a transformation. Uh, the idea of the character sliding came in later and, and we needed to have a cool level where you could slide around. Um, so we changed the canyon level to be the sliding level. We also had a level that was basically this underground cavern which I wanted to be completely architectural and was a very um, a very difficult task to uh, figure out how to implement that. And this is one early version of it. So this is what Journey looked like when it was first made. It's a very different looking game now. You can see there's a sort of bipedal character with pants on. <laughs> this was one of the early interactions. You could walk up to a piece of cloth and sing and then you would fly over it as if it were suddenly you had no gravity. <laughs> it was really janky, but it worked, you know, that was, we needed to feel it. Um, we started building these experiences where you had to cross big chasms and to build out the sense of scale. So people started to come into the team and there was more dialogue about what Journey would be and how it was going to be. And we started with our attempt to lead you to the mountain. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a very tiny mountain in the background there. <laughs> That's where you're going. I think we improved on it a little bit. I don't know what you guys think, but this is what it looked like. And from there, um, I wanted the character, I, I wanted to iterate on the character and make it better. And one thing I tried to do was add more detail and um, it got more and more complex. And this character took a really long time to make. He actually had completely animated fingers and everything and it was really crazy. Um, he was in the game for one day and then the programmers were like, this is way too hard to make actually work, so forget it. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I actually had this drawing and this character that I made. I was like, oh my god, what if we put like a hundred arms on him? And, um, <laughs> and they were just like, no. So, um, <laughs> so I, I kind of had to go back to the drawing board. And I started thinking about flower. And that game had basically like flower petals. As that was what you played as. I was like, how do I make the character for the next That Game Company game? And it has to be more simple. So the, actually, the next design was this version. Um, and this is where I started to think about removing anything that really wasn't necessary for the gameplay. Gameplay at that point wasn't 
about climbing or anything with arms, so I took the arms off. It's all about walking, um, so he's got little feet. So we had the PlayStation prototype up, and we started working on the networking backend and trying to implement that plan, and that was going to take a long time. So what would we work on while we waited for the networking to come online while well, we'd start working on the characters? So here is one of the character designs for Journey. This is uh, more like a piece of paper that's been folded. Um, you can see that we had started working on the trail. So um, the technology for actually deforming the sand was not built yet. So there were little cubes that followed you everywhere, like pieces of cheese. And uh, at the top there, that's the, um, that's the HUD that tells us how well or poorly the game is performing. We built a lot of environments just to test what it would feel like to be in this weird space. Some of them were interiors. We started to experiment with lighting and color. And we also had different types of puzzles using the cloth as a way of lifting you. This is one where you have sort of a traditional switch. You go up to it, the cloth rolls down, someone else can come up. We made a lot of prototypes. Specifically, we really focused on taking these ideas we had, all those sketches I showed you from February, March, April, and just kind of getting a one-off into the game, just trying to see what it would feel like. This is the first title screen that we made. It's funny to work on a game. I mean, you can see it was October of 2009, but we always are trying to make the game look as finished as possible at all times. We put a title screen in because it's going to be important to drive people to the mountain. Even though it doesn't look anything like this now, it was inspired by this. We put in environments that were harsh, with shelters, with wind, we even experimented with giving you more than one scarf, being able to show different types of players with different kinds of outfits. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the reward for finding a player. Whoa, what's happening with the camera? from my phone, so people's gonna hear whatever we say. <laughs> Where are you, Nick? <laughs> my, my camera shaked, but I don't see my, my sh sh shout effects. Yeah, in this version, the shout seems to be invisible. <laughs> That's the rope effect.
Hey Nick, I'm, I'm starting the Ancestor cutscene. Well, you can try to hijack, it would be good to show people that you can mess up. <laughs> yeah, that was the mountain. So basically this is one of the early versions of these ancestor interactions. And you see two guys kind of like overlapping because there's no yeah, code at that point to tell them to not sit right on top of each other. And what he does is he just kind of comes out and then he flies away. And it's really awkward and you can kind of see up his skirt and it's like and then he just like disappears. It's like, oh great, okay, what was that about? So So we had to change that. Just, they just didn't seem meaningful at all. Um, and you can see that the game was really ugly back then, so. Well, I, no, <laughs> I, I didn't. Well, let's go to level two. Green time. <laughs> it's a dragon. Don't drag it. Where is it? Look at that guy actually does look kind of colors in it. It's the same dragon. Make it run fast. <laughs> Do you hear the drum? Every time I run close to Nick, the drum will start. This level was pretty interesting. Uh, we wanted this sense of openness and happiness in the desert level, where players kind of at this point in the game know how to play the game and are meeting other people and are having a lot of fun. And um, I went for the sky being green because I actually wanted to save the color blue for the last part of the game. I wanted that blue color to become a reward for players. Um, kind of like a breath of fresh air. You never see any blue sky until that last area. So I was like, well, if I can't do blue, I'm just going to do green, I guess. In journey, you go to pick up those cloth strands, um, and you fly, and you love them. Uh, and when two people who love strands they me they meet, uh, and one guy takes the resource and he flies, then the other guys hate you. Uh, and in fact, in our early days of uh, playtesting, people were saying like, "I really don't want to be with the other player. You know, they don't belong here because they're gonna steal my resource." Um, so for quite a while, we, in order to compensate, we, we thought we have a great idea. We have the player who uh, dropped the resource it. after they use them, so they, they don't actually consume resource. Well, so maybe that way the player will love them. So this is an early stage kind of 3D prototype. And you can see if the player flies, he drops all these kind of uh, strands right behind them. So uh, for the other player, he can just pick them up and fly up for free. Uh, it's kind of like a communism thing, you know, you share all the resource. Um, but the problem is that even though uh, mathematically you, you share it, uh, psychologically you don't. Um, a lot of player complains about how I picked up all these resource and I carried all the way to the other guy and he got to use my resource to fly. He takes advantage of my labor, even though most of them are not intentional. And a lot of people feel kind of uh, very weird when there's a guy stalking you and stay behind you and just pick up your stuff. And, and, and so they, they just think this is, you know, this, they still feel like there's some kind of stealing happening. Um, so in order to really eliminate that, so at least people don't hate each other, we decided to drop the idea of, of possession, like resource. Uh, we just have infinite resource except the player have a limited pocket size. You can only carry this much money, right? So, um, and people go to the resource, they all pick up their money and they can all fly. 
and they don't hate each other. And so our first goal is there should be no lobby, right? It should be auto automatically connect you with people. Um, second thing that comes into online game is everybody have n names, PSN IDs, uh, but most of the people's names are very aggressive because they've been playing all these competitive games. And even with, you know, Paris Pilton, right, it still takes you out of the world and all of a sudden you are in real life and thinking about real context, which kind of breaks the immersion, which we just transported you into a desert where you're alone. Um, and the very next thing, people are like, oh, this is an online game, we need to chat, I need to text, I need to talk to people because that's just given what online games are. I remember this conversation we had with Sony, which is, you know, shall we actually uh, embed a friend invite system because that is gonna create viral uh, opportunity for your game to recruit more gamers. But then once they invite each other and they couldn't talk to each other, then they were like, why isn't this game have that? And really, Journey is a game about strangers. It's, it's more unique if you don't know how old they are, who they are, and you just look at them as a pure human being. <laughs> um, so in the end, the only thing we carried from the online is we will display the name tag, uh, uh, the PSN ID of the other player after the entire game is finished. Uh, number four. Four? Right. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I remember I tried to go. Good idea. <laughs> Whoa, we're like fighting wind together. That's, That's the drafting. Grapple, dude. Is grapple? Does grapple work here? That's the grapple beat. If you're near another guy, you will initiate grapple Fly over first so I can use your trail. Okay, all right, let's go to the desert again and try the sandstorm. So we really needed to get another round of prototypes done, and we needed to drive ourselves forward, even though we had all these questions about the networking, which wasn't quite ready yet, and questions about playing together and this connection, which we weren't really creating. So we started to focus on how the game actually felt. Um, and this is something that we all spent a lot of time playing and thinking about. The, the world started to become more tactile. We put in particle systems, we added lighting, we worked on the textures of the game to make the game feel more like a real place. We polished up some of the visuals for long distance viewing. We started to try and build out the silhouettes of individual views of the game that would really drive people forward. We also started playing with mechanics like revealing the story through these images that you could discover. And we added some characters who could guide the player in a way. And we had some really bad temp UI like 
hold any button, <laughs> which we totally got rid of eventually. Um, but these were the sorts of things that we left the year working on, just trying to get the game to feel better because we had all these deep questions in our mind about what we would be able to accomplish. At the end of the first year of the journey development, the game is uh, supposed to look like this. Uh, this is the concept art uh, Matt Nava has drawn. But this is what the game kind of looked like. You know, we kind of blocked it out. Um, and this is the second bridge area, which is supposed to look like this. We have some basic foundation of it. We actually blocked out the entire game uh, before the first year. So we have the final mountain level and underground level, uh, except uh, this is the target of the emotion. Uh, this is how it feels. You know, nothing really kind of makes me feel anything. The game sucks. Nobody have any confidence it's going to do well. And then I was like, well, what if we took off even more? So I took off the feet, as you can see on that drawing down there. And I took off the head, and then it was just a kite. And um, I was like, maybe, well, maybe that's a little too much. Uh, <laughs> but um, that kite character actually did end up appearing in the game. You see them in the desert, these kind of flying... We call them the fish, but they were very basically like these kind of cloth kites. So this kind of experimentation and removing even more actually was the uh, kind of where that idea for those characters came. So, um, but eventually we realized we need to have this character um, use completely simulated cloth because the previous characters were all joint-driven animation and it was just like this looping, waving animation on the cloth that looked really stiff. So. These drawings were um, done to kind of create an idea for how the character might go together with a dynamic piece of cloth. Um, we eventually figured out that if we wanted to make this interact with the player in the way that they do in the game, um, we wouldn't be able to easily animate a character that was organic like this. So we actually decided to go with a segmented character um, because of that. So we, I started thinking about what if they're kind of more like these robotic sculptural creatures? Um, and this is one of the very first versions we had of the what we call the guardians, but they're also kind of like the stone dragons, snakes um, that chase you. In April, we focused on the sand and we made it sparkly and pretty. But it wasn't really sparkly enough. <laughs> we also decided to make the character out of cloth, which was a huge change halfway through our development cycle, but we did it anyway because we felt that the cloth showed movement in a way that the previously designed characters just couldn't. It made the character feel like they were part of the world. And so we just cranked on it. And by the time that we got around E3, we were ready to show a beautiful world with atmospheric cloudscapes, glowing lights and bloom, and this textured sand that you could push around with your feet. The trail went from being a bunch of boxes to being this really cool movement in the sand. Lucky for us, it worked. Our E3 announcement created a ton of buzz, even though we were the very last slot on the very last day with a hands-off demo. <laughs> Genova and Kelly gave a fantastic presentation, which really communicated not just what the game could be, but our passion about making it and why we thought it was important to reimagine multiplayer gameplay, which is something that I still think is a core reason why it resonated so much with the audience.
Hi, I'm Adam Robozoli with Attract Mode. We're at E3 2010 at the Into the Pixel exhibition, and I'm here with Genova Chen of that game company. Um, Genova, thanks for uh, you know being here with us for the interview. Well, thanks for having me here. You just announced Journey for the PlayStation Network. It's your third title. Can, are you? Can you say what emotion you're you're trying to convey through Journey? Okay, I thought, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, first of all, I think if this emotion can be summarized in a word, then we don't need a game here. Did you do a lot of prototyping, um, or what was your development uh, strategy like? Um, so Journey is an online game. Uh, we have a very unique approach towards what we want this online interaction between people to happen. Uh, so we started prototyping the very first week we started the project, we started doing, doing playtesting actually. Uh, we learned a lot because we've never done any online games in the past. It gives me a, a, a very brand new glimpse at what humanity is in the virtual space. It was disappointing for a while, you know. Uh, Why was it disappointing? <laughs> well, just realizing how human works, you know, when they leave the reality to enter a virtual realm and what's their uh, initial response. Um, it's a big learning lesson for me. Um, we are lucky that stuff we are trying to accomplish in this game is very simple. <laughs> uh, if it was more sophisticated, we probably would have failed that. I mean, the world, it's, you know, a very beautiful but barren world from the screenshots we've seen. Um, are the only characters you will interact with be other people, or are there, have you done, like, any artificial intelligence? There are uh, other things in this world, and I don't want to tell you because th the game is about you go there to explore the world. And uh, I want to leave that for you to, to experience it. Is there a win condition or is it something to just be experienced and not necessarily win? Well, this is kind of cliche, but I know a lot of kids like this, this sentence, which is, it's all about the journey, not the destination. <laughs> October. So we started bringing that concept art for the early desert into existence, focusing again on these cloudscapes, trying to understand how wind would look in the game, the movement, being able to take a screenshot that shows you that movement was a real triumph for us. For a long time, the character always just looked like they were kind of running in place. We started to get this sense of motion in the, cam in the character itself. Also, you'll notice the camera is a little bit different. We started really playing with this landscape camera that positions the player strategically for vistas, really give the player a sense of where they are. And so we keep pushing it, you know, at the end of the second year. Um, this is the trailer we made in the, at the end of the second year. Um, and you can see this is very similar to the final trailer. You know, we have, except the sand is not as sparkling and some of the model is not very polished. Um, but you can see mostly the character is there, the scene is there, and the storyline is almost there.
So this is the curve we, we measured at the end of the second year. Um, it's basically there. You know, like we have the first four levels basically there. Um, and we have a lot of people coming to play test. And the, the result is not good. And they say this game is really bad. Um, some people told me, you know, before the final heaven level, um, when, when the player died, you should just cut it there because the later part is making the game worse. I'm like, what, really? Um, so w I looked at the game, and, and what happened is that um, if you look at the green curve, right, this is the final emotional rise. Um, and that is not even bigger than the level where the water is kind of floating. Um, and that's not even higher than the sand surfing level. It's not exciting. It's not satisfying. But the guy was saying, like, when he died and accidentally the game crashed, he was staring at the white screen for about two minutes with, without nobody noticing. And he was in a deep thinking. He was like, this is very serious it's tragedy. Uh, <laughs> And he really liked it, you know. And, and I started to look at why. I'm, I'm like, actually, if you jump from that level to the very bottom where you just died, it's the biggest emotional change. And it's actually, you reverse it, it's actually a catharsis of tragedy. Um, but that's not what we intended. You know, we're not trying to make a sad story here. Um, so we actually took another year just to fix that problem. So we also tried um, creating this character out of cloth. And um, what we found was that the cloth felt, it didn't feel scary. Um, it felt good. So we actually decided to um, make another character in the game that you run into. This guy, um, who uses the exact same technology as the ones that are frightening. Um, and you ride on him, and he's, he's super fun. So um, that technology got reused for that obviously. But one thing that um, was probably the most difficult thing to design for these bad guys was the face. Um, I wanted to have this very scary and memorable um, face to the bad guy. Uh, and it took me a long time to come up with this. And the way that I came up with it was actually by doing this drawing here, which is kind of like, my idea was, well, what if your character you control was actually you know, it was this dark side, so I did this um, Cyclops kind of version, and that was really what um, guided me to the actual um, design that we went with for the, for the bad guys. And so here you can see uh, kind of how, how they ended up. And they have two kind of states in the game where you see them as a sculptural form, and then they turn alive, chase you. And um, we had to make sure that they could... Uh, do all of those things. So it was quite a challenging thing to design. Um, and this is one of the final levels where you're climbing this tower. And this painting is blue, right? It's like, it used to actually be the same level as the previous level, which is very blue. So in the very end, I decided I need to change level color. So it actually ended up like this in the game. I swapped it to be orange, and it kind of really was a good choice, I think, because that gave it a more of a holy feel. As it started became like this temple, um, and it kind of worked with the music and everything like that.
uh, in a lot of games um, today, you don't have a choice. If you start a co-op game, you have to finish the game with this person. It's not like, you know, I, I would start a game with my roommate and then the second day I'm busy, my roommate is like, oh, can we finish that game? No, I don't have time. I don't want to feel obligated to collaborate with someone. I wanted to be able to play my, with myself, but I could also engage in a co-op if I feel too lonely, you know. It's like this game gives you the freedom to decide your play style, you know, between single player to multiplayer, between play competitively or cooperate, cooperatively. I think the more f choices we give to the player, the, the deeper and the better experience will become. Um, and when, you, when you're playing with someone in a world where co-op is actually a choice, the fact you choose to collaborate will make that person appreciate you even more. Because um, when I play Left 4 Dead, for example, I think this game is supposed to be about surviving together and building a bond. But a lot of time, people just kill me near the end and grab my health pack, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because, well, we were forced to collaborate all the way through, but that doesn't necessarily mean that person really wants to, really want to help me. Uh, but by creating uh, choices, then I really know what kind of player is a player that wanted to work with me and what kind of player just kind of pass by and move on, you know. Um, and I think that this will be a very unique experience because nothing has existed like that in the past. So Flower made you know, pretty extensive use out of the six-axis controls. <laughs> right. How do the six-axis controls come into play in Journey? Um, currently, we are looking to a very unique way to use the six-axis control to control the camera. Uh, because you know, in traditional uh, first-person shooter game, you use the right stick to look up and down and left and right. right. And I often hear complaints about they want to reverse the x-axis uh, x or they want to reverse the y-axis because different people have different preference. Right. Um, but in Journey, we use the tilt. So if we look up, we want to look up, we just tilt up the controller. It seems like more intuitive to people who haven't played a lot of games. Um, but for camera control particularly, we are still kind of in the middle of uh, trying to figure out because there are people who play our game who wanted to have traditional controls. Um, so we are still kind of trying to refine it. Hi everybody, uh, this is Genova Chen, the creative director from that game company. Uh, here with me are uh, Matt Namba, our art director. Hi. John Edwards, the lead engineer. Hey guys. Uh, Nick Clark, the lead designer. Hello. And uh, the famous Austin Wintery, the oh, composer geez. behind the music of Journey. <laughs> Hi. So this is like the first tutorial sequence here that we teach the player how to use their flight ability, but you can actually skip this whole sequence. Like we don't ever force the player to go to this building and collect this first secret. Um, which was actually somewhat of a problem in some of the earlier playtests, but we made it look attractive enough that almost all the players do end up just directing themselves here. Um, but one thing that was important to us in development was to never force a decision upon the player. So you could skip it if you wanted to. This statue is a broken version of the Sphinx that you see at the Ancestors. And it's actually kind of silly because there used to be an ancestor here. We used to have two ancestors in this level. There <laughs> used to be the seventh ancestor. Yes. Uh, I like the game. very old version where the ancestor came out and, and you were, you were um, like lateral to the mountain and you both would turn and then the ancestor would flying off. He would actually the fly all the way to the mountain and you have to watch him. Yeah. It was quite silly.
took a long time. So why don't you tell us about these uh, paintings? So yeah, these also took a lot of iteration to get to a stage that was uh, something that everybody felt good about. It was, um, for a long time, they were just these very hard to understand, well maybe they still are, but <laughs> um, gameplay elements. They had a lot more like sequences and all they sorts to, of things. They used to be like animated where you could yeah. activate them multiple times and each time there would be a different image, but then people thought there was some mechanic where they'd have to like activate a certain number of times to like unlock some something. Yeah, a puzzle. Um, yeah, it was like a puzzle or something. in the game that to me felt very like the word that always came to mind was charming or like you because you create this landscape that looks super bleak uh, and and kind of desolate and then like that little moment where it's almost like a flock of birds lifting you up yes yeah, like, the first like lively moment you come across I think in, in the game yeah it's very it's, it's, it's like an really initial good. hint that there is still life in the environment and we do sort of that was intentional like we do kind of build up the life that we present to you um, incrementally as you play. This is the first area in the game where the, the, the internet actually tries to connect you between players. And we don't know when we will be running into them, but you know this is the first stage where it's possible. And because of that, we tried to design the whole stage to make it easier for people to find each other. And that's why we put the big cliff on the side, make it so that you have to figure out how to get out of this area so you spend more time in this area. Yeah, and like the puzzles are kind of arranged in this triangular fashion, so you, you kind of re-traverse the same areas over and over again, um, whereas some of the later levels, like the level after this, it's more linear, we're going from the start to the end. Um, but in this area, you it's more likely to run across someone because you're spending more time in sort of a more confined area. Yeah, so the deck match and the triangular shape, they in what the player is climbing right now is one of the, you know, according to the internet, the stone serpent. Um, and uh, there are three of them and they just form this triangle. Um, so when you move from one to the other, it's very likely you can see the other players.
So these little uh, cloth fish creatures, as we called them, um, they started off very scripted, but uh, we thought that that wasn't very fun or very replayable, and so um, Brian, one of our game designers, actually sort of rewrote them to be entirely AI-driven, um, with some like scripting hints, but um, they are a lot more reactive and natural uh, now than they were earlier on in development. They kind of serve as a, as a proxy for another player, but obviously uh, they're sort of a more primitive life form, so since we don't have a human AI, uh, it still works pretty well. They can follow you kind of like a dog. Right, and they are kind of like the next sort of hint or step in the presence of life in this world. Um, so there is definitely an evolution in terms of how we present that. We also have a hint here. Notice all the creature that's made of claws are coming out of the stone serpent. Uh, yeah, that's the first, well, the next kind of reveal in that whole narrative in the game. One of the early kind of things we were trying to do with the game is uh, we were kind of using a, a hiking metaphor uh, for a variety of reasons, but we were just trying early on to make a game that you could enjoy uh, where you didn't have some superpower or super speed where you could just walk through like a normal person would when they go into nature for a hike. Uh, you could kind of go at about that speed and uh, just enjoy the environment and, and, and live in a place. And so we had to work really hard on making that kind of environment that is just naturally enjoyable. And then we still have to make the player really fast. Yeah, so this is the, the level which we, we realize we have to create a mechanics like surfing. Uh, because if, if the entire dune is just walking, it feels very repetitive. Uh, so at some point, the game had a sandstorm where you actually have to seek for shelter in order to survive. Uh, but eventually, the sandstorm is more like become this particular area. Um, yeah, that was a much better choice because this is a built thing, you know. I feel like it speaks to the sort of subtext of the narrative and things. Then an opportunity to talk about a little bit about the architecture of the game um, and how it was designed. It was also designed based on constraints from gameplay, kind of like the choice to make some guy green. Um, one funny thing is there's a lot of archways and things in Journey. Originally I wanted them to be round arches, but um, due to our constraints with collision detection, <laughs> we needed to have um, arches that did not have surfaces like that, so we chose to make them these kind of stair-step arches, because they work better with our tech, and that kind of influenced the entire design of the architecture. Me I was going to say that one of the things for me that felt so important was when we decided at the very, very, very end to change the style of the cutscene graphics. Like, you had like a weekend, oh, yeah. I think, where you yeah, came one in. Weekend. T tell that story. That's a really great one. <laughs> that, was, that was intense. Yeah, we, we had this idea that, um, well, we had that, like, it goes all the way back to the tech. Like, we had this tech for Flower where it was like, there's segmented levels, there's just load at the end. And we didn't plan that into the initial game. And so you got to this point, you're like, well, there's just a weird fade to black for no reason. Like, why? We need to have something that segments the experience. So yeah. we're like, okay, we'll have a cutscene. Um, cut and at first we thought, like, oh, we'll just have these kind of glyph images that will show up. And I had this idea for them being, you know, carved stone. And, yeah, stills. And then John Edwards was like, no, we don't have enough texture memory for that. So. <laughs> You'll have to make them like pixel art. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So then I figured that out. And then I started, we just tested them forever. I had this collection of images that we were like, what does this mean? You know, like all these people would be like, I have no idea. <laughs> that um, makes no sense to and me. I was like, oh my God, how do you make this image communicate clearly? And there was one weekend when I came in and I just, I had this idea for a cutscene that's halfway through the game where you see your own journey in this yes. kind of circular <laughs> camera cut. Um, awesome. And that once I did that one, once I had that concept, I was like, okay, now I can figure this out. And yeah. I, I had to put animation in, and I w came in one weekend. You know, Journey was originally a one and a half year project, and a year in, we know clearly this is, a, this is something that needs a lot more attention and care. Yeah. 
And so we were, you know, talking to Sony to say, hey, can we extend this to a, you know, three-year project? Uh, no, we don't have oh. money. Yeah, technically uh, we asked for two years and then we right, asked for another right, yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, we don't have money. And then we got two years. And at the end of the second year, <laughs> we have the whole game together. But, you know, it's still clearly not emotional. Uh, and so we asked Sony to give us more money. <laughs> and they just got hacked for the PlayStation Network. And Sony wasn't winning for, for console. So, you know, they are, they, they said, you know, we can only give you one more time, right? Yeah, but then they, not we had anymore. friends there. They were nice to us. Right. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the project, when we were doing the mountain level, we were running out of money. You know, everybody's taking pay cut ever since the third year. Like, yeah. you know, we are already on a shoestring budget. Everybody's getting low salary, and then we all took half pay because we really want to finish the game, and we, we know, you know, we have so much love in it. So Austin and I, we, we keep saying, you know, like, um, you know, we made the final level and then Austin got very excited about final level. He would make a music and then the music is so emotional. I'm like, this level sucks. Come yeah, we to had his, to change to his music. Well, the first version of the final level was on yeah. rails. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Like it was, yeah, it was Star was, Fox. Yeah, you no, literally were flying yeah. through it these wasn't rings, even and you could, you could like, it was, it was we, the we, very we, last we thing we made. We used knights as, a, as an right. example. Yeah, and then we rough. make the game better. We thought, okay, finally we caught up to Austin. And then Austin felt like his music is worse. Yeah. And then he would rewrite the music. I think the final level's music happened three times or something, or four times, and then. Eventually, uh, when I'm playing it, I, 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 I was touched every time uh, when that moment uh, of the gameplay and the music happened to be both on the climax. Yeah. But like we had these very like, kind of specific endings where the like, journeyers meet their ancestors. Or yeah, like it was a yeah. big party at the end. A big party, yeah. It was yeah, not big good. party. And oh, like, man. It, it took like, this kind of stroke of thinking about it from a different angle to um, come up with the image that we went with. It was kind of like, okay, take everything away, like end in a very similar way to where you began. Um, yeah, in the, way, in, in, the, in the way that a snake eats its own tail and that right. everything happens over and over, that every project is a disaster, that you know everything that you sure. dream of doing just ends up being way bigger than you expected. How do you feel about Journey in hindsight when you look back on it? Is it mm -hmm. uh, do you have any regrets with that game or, or things that you wish you had done differently? Uh, I think the, the management and the process of journeys making was terrible. Uh, that's also partially because I have no idea how to manage. You know, I'm a game creator. I'm not a MBA student. You know, right. it's the studio. One thing I noticed is game developers tend to be mentally more uh, youthful or immature than uh, you know, other, other industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's partially because we need to be creative. We need to sure. think outside the box. But you know, if you work in a game studio, you will realize there's all kinds of personalities, right? Um, and uh, because of that, there was a lot of fighting. Uh, there was a lot of uh, stuff going on in the studio that you know, it caused, you know, a lot of damage between people's relationship. Um, but in a way, if we would have managed this very well back then, and uh, everything went smoothly, I wouldn't think Journey would be equally powerful. Because, you know, like, a game really reflects the people who are making it. Absolutely. The, the struggle we went through in the last year of Journey was pretty insane, and I think that is also why when I was working on the struggle level, I was able to channel my own struggle into the game. I remember I was tweaking how far can the player walk in the snow mountain. Was it 30 seconds? Was it two minutes? Yeah. Was it five minutes before you really fall? And I was just walking on that, I think it was 2 a.m., I was alone in the office, and you know, <laughs> the company is about to run out of money. People are talking about quitting. People are talking about disassembling the company, and 
I still worry about whether I have cancer or not because at the time there was some medical complication and I was just kind of crying while I was, while I was making and testing the game myself. I was yeah. like, I'm, I'm pushing forward. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think if it wasn't for the difficulty of the, the project, I probably won't have the inspiration of making the final scene of Journey. Well, it's not the final scene, it's the, the scene before the climax. Yeah. Uh, but I was crying at my own game I was, while I was making it. I, this never happened before. Is Journey your born to run? Is that is Journey your sort of seminal masterpiece to uh, date, do you think? Yeah, I actually think about this subject a lot because I've seen many great directors making their masterpiece when they were young, but they were never able to top it afterwards. Yeah. I mean, if, if you look at Godfather, you know, if you look at, you know, even Stanley Kubrick, you know, like I wouldn't say his last movie is my favorite, right? Um, but, but yeah, it, it has been a, a humongous pressure. Uh, I mean, every day I would go to the office looking at the two Guinness records on, my, you know, on, the, on the award trophy table. It's like the most award winning for an indie game. I was just like, there's no way I can do a game that's you know, on par with Journey. Even if it's on par, people will still be disappointed, right? And I, I just felt like I'm, I'm on a quest to fail if I try to even compete with myself. 